a session on understanding college admission from a broad perspective, the search and application process primarily. This is not a PLU presentation, so hopefully you're here for that, um, although that's where I work and I'll explain that here in a second, um, but I'm here just to talk about college in general, so hopefully that's what you're here for. Uh, the way to communicate with me is through the Q&A or the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can ask questions anonymously or by your name um, that you have here in Zoom. Um, so it gives you a lot of options. It is hard for me to look at the Q&A while presenting. So um, I may not get to your question during my presentation but I will definitely get to it at the end. I uh, have plenty of time left at the end of this session and we'll stay until all of your questions are answered. So hopefully that helps you get a little bit more information about what to expect in this session. But just as we're kind of starting slowly, uh, we're gonna use polls during this so that I at least have a sense that there's people in the room because <laughs> it always feels a little weird um, presenting basically to a wall in my house. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll while we're still waiting. It looks like a couple more people just joined us. So if you um, can let me know who's here. I'd love to see who's in the space, although this was definitely a presentation geared towards seniors and their families. I know that sometimes other students sneak in too, which is totally fine. Um, so if you happen to be an underclassman, that is okay. Um, but I'd love to see who's in the space. All right. So it looks like mostly seniors and parents and guardians, which is great. Um, so that's exactly what the session is for. So that's perfect. Um, I just always wanna know before we get started. So thank you for letting me know who's here. And some of these I'll share with you when they, when they seem to matter. So um, we'll do that as well. All right, looks like the participant number has slowed down. So I'm gonna... Um, advance to the next slide. If for some reason you now don't see PLU on the screen, I'm just using this as a way, um, let me know in that Q&A function. It means that something's not working with my sharing of my presentation. So this is kind of my practice slide uh, just in case. But hopefully you see PLU on the screen um, and that allows us to get started. So I'm gonna introduce myself before we jump into the presentation so you know why I'm here. Um, my name is Melody Ferguson and I am the Associate Dean of Admission at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, I've been there for about eight years. Um, and before that, I worked at two other universities here in Washington. So I worked at big public schools, smaller regional colleges, and now a private institution here in Tacoma. So I've worked in higher education, college admission for about 20 years. So that's why I'm hopefully knowledgeable enough to at least guide you through this process. Um, but also know that this is a year I've never experienced either. But what's great is um, I have colleagues at all sorts of colleges and universities across the state, and I've gotten together with them a few times this year as we've discussed what we're going to do. And so I'm going to be able to share some of their examples um, and some of the things that at least Washington colleges are doing and maybe some questions you can ask if you're looking at out-of-state colleges as well. So. That's where I'm coming from and that's my background and that's why I'm here. Uh, I also live in Bonnie Lake, Washington, so not far from the White River School District. Um, so uh, I'm experiencing the same windstorm you might be experiencing today as well. Um, and I have a son who will be a ninth grader next year. So um, I feel like I'm now coming upon this as not just a professional thing that I like to do, but also a personal thing I like to do because I find this process to be confusing uh, and I know that I would love to be of service to kind of any of you who have questions um, and to make this process a little bit easier. So that's where we're headed um, and that's why I'm here. So I really appreciate your counseling staff um, you know, kind of giving me this opportunity and hopefully you'll get some of your basic questions answered as well. All right, so jumping right in, as I was preparing for this presentation, I was um, reading up on some of the things kind of that we're hearing about your side of things. So what we're hearing from students, from families about their anxiety or their questions or their concerns about this year. And so this survey came out and I actually thought it was really appropriate to start this session. And it was about kind of what even is preventing families from even starting to research colleges because just getting started, I think, is 
the hardest part sometimes because you don't know where to start necessarily or, or maybe one of these other reasons is coming up. This was done in August, so it was a little bit before school started, so you might be in a slightly different place. But I am curious um, of those who are here with us today, kind of where are you at? Um, so I'm going to launch another poll and I will share this one with you. Um, so it should come up on your screen here in a second and you might have to scroll down um, to actually see all of the answers. Um, they're the same as the ones on the screen, um, except for I added one others, um, a couple others as catch-all ones. But I'm curious for you, what seems to be giving you the most stress or causing you the most questions? Um, or maybe if, it, if you have been kind of feeling like you can't even get started, what is, start, what is halting that process? And it might be more than one of these, that's okay, but you know, just um, choose one that maybe most hits you for today. There's a lot of people in this space feeling similarly and very different, which I actually appreciate because I think that's what's making this year so confusing and even so hard for your teachers and counselors to help you out um, because everyone's coming at this from a different place. All right, looks like the majority of you have voted. So I'm gonna actually share this. So you can see kind of um, in the room what people are feeling. So hopefully you can now see uh, these decisions. You can see it's kind of across the board. A lot of you are, just kind of have that all that stress and worry and pressure either from this process or from so much that's going on right now. Don't even know where to start. That's always, I think, the number one answer. Um, and also just, uh, you know, some of the other things, too busy. Uh, I know a lot of people say, oh, we should have more time right now, but I feel like um, we're all just as busy as we were. It's just different. So this makes a lot of sense. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing the results. Sometimes it takes a second for the, um, the poll to go away, but it will. All right, that helps me get a sense of where all of you are at. So we're gonna start with, how do I even get started? And we're gonna spend a couple slides talking about that. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I'm not gonna to get to like do these activities with you, um, but just to get your head in the right space about things that you should and could be thinking about. And then we're gonna talk about how to apply. But as we talk about that, it's gonna also help some of you that don't even know where to start. So that's the plan for the night. So I want um, all of you, whether you're a, a parent or a guardian or a family member or a student, to start thinking about what matters to you. And obviously this should mostly be about what matters to that senior, um, that student that is kind of graduating this year. But uh, we do know that a lot of times the college decision is a family decision in some ways. So um, there is a process that you have to go through together. But this is something that I, these are questions you can start asking yourself that are gonna impact which schools you should apply to, which schools you should research, um, because this is about what school is right for you, which might be different than what's right for your best friend or a family member or someone else, um, because really we wanna get personal to figure out where you're gonna be successful. When you're choosing a college, it's not just about choosing the place that's gonna support you academically. That's very important, obviously. But it's also about choosing a place that is gonna support you, your hobbies, your passions, your interests um, as well, because you're gonna spend more time in college not going to school than going to school, actually, because the amount of time in class um, is less than you're used to, uh, especially if you're thinking about moving away to college or those kind of things. You have to think about the bigger picture. So some questions to start asking yourself if you haven't already. Um, and some of these are gonna be easy to answer. Some of these you might have to think about. But what's your learning style? I think this is one a lot of students don't even think about, but it's critical because schools teach differently. Class sizes are different. Um, are you someone that can take a lecture, like someone speaking to you, and that's an easy way for you to learn? Are you someone that really works with your teachers right now, and that's a part of your learning process? Or maybe you like group work or learning and discussion, um, or you're a visual learner. Those are things that you have to know about yourself and might actually help you choose the college that's gonna help you be most successful. Because different colleges are different sizes and shapes and maybe kind of strive to teach differently. Um, so this is something that you can start to think about and it's gonna, um, we're gonna turn all of these into questions here in a second. Uh, what are your academic goals and aspirations? 
Some of you have no idea, right? Being an undecided student, knowing you want to go to college, but not knowing what you want to be when you grow up or what you want to study is perfectly fine. Uh, I actually find those students to be some of my favorite because they're a little more open-minded. So when someone asks you what you want to study and you're undecided, just tell them you're open-minded, not undecided. It sounds better. Um, but also, you know, some of you have very clear goals and aspirations. You know this is what you want to study. Um, it's what you have a passion for. It's what you think you want to be when you grow up at this point. Um, and either way, if you know what you want to do, you want a school that can support your goals and aspirations. A big school does not mean they have every major. A small school does not mean they don't have that program. So you can't kind of judge a school by their size or shape. You have to really ask those questions. If you're undecided, you really want to start thinking about how a college or university helps you decide what you want to study, what you want to major in. Because at the end of those four years, you do want to graduate with a degree. And so during those four years, probably those first two critical years, how are they helping students uh, figure that out? Or is it something students really have to do on their own or discern on their own? So that's um, just something to start thinking about. Have you looked to see your likelihood of be, to be accepted? I'm going to give you some um, website links along the way, and I will email those to you probably tomorrow um, as well. And there's a couple websites where you can actually look at your GPA, look at some of your kind of um, other criteria, and you can see what your chances are of being accepted into a college. Um, I'm going to also give you some statistics at the end, but it's easier to get into college than most students realize. And so um, it's important, though, that you know kind of what your likelihood is. So that might help you figure out, you know, do I need to put together an extra strong application? Um, is this a safety school for me, meaning it might be a school that I can get into easily? Or is this going to be a stretch school for me, a school that I'm going to have to really put my best foot forward and maybe even go above and beyond in some ways I'll explain soon? Does geography even matter? For some students, it totally does. They want to be in a college town or a big city. They want to go out of state or in state. Um, they have a real kind of sense of geography playing an important part of this decision. For some students, it's not about that at all. Um, they can be close to home or far away from home. They're really looking for something else when it comes to choosing a college. Have you thought about type of school? This is one of those where if you haven't experienced, haven't visited, haven't um, done a lot of things related to college, I think this is kind of hard. Like, how do I know if I want a big or small school or a public or a private college? You probably don't. Um, but maybe you apply to a couple in some of those different categories and really think about learning style and academic goals to help inform maybe what's, what style might work for you. And we'll also talk about who you can talk to about that. What are your hobbies or passions? This goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where it shouldn't just be about academics. That's very important. But I think we're going to have dogs barking. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, what are your hobbies and your passions? And then, um, you know, do you are you on a 504 plan or an IEP plan? Are you someone who needs some extra support to be successful academically? That's great. And a lot of colleges will support those with accommodations. Um, those plans don't come with you to college, but some of the things that you're receiving now, some of those accommodations will, um, but not every college can do everything. So again, you have to ask those questions. And then what am I willing to pay? Um, most of us don't just have um, four years of college tuition saved. It's uh, not entirely common. Uh, so for most of us, it's about not what can I afford, um, because we don't have that just sitting there ready. But what am I willing to pay? How hard am I willing to work um, to apply for scholarships, to get a summer job, to save, um, but even maybe to take out loans if you have to. And, and we're not going to get into financial aid in this session, but I'm more than happy to talk about that later um, uh, on a different day or time. Um, but this is something just to start having that conversation now. So when you start to see financial aid awards, you know whether it's something you're willing to pay or not. So these are just some questions. There's so many more, but I thought these were a good place to start. Once you have the answers to some of these questions or maybe more that you can think of that are gonna help you narrow this down, you need to take those and apply them using some different things that are available to you to research colleges. 
Um, this year's different, right? A lot of times people just talk about visit, 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 which we're going to talk about. Um, but for some families, they're not comfortable with that yet. Or for some schools, they're not open to that yet. So what are ways that you can research colleges um, with or without a visit? So we will talk about that, but there's other options. There are virtual college fairs going on pretty much every week and weekend. I'm going to give you some dates um, on a final slide so that you can maybe even engage in some of those where anywhere from 200 to 600 colleges are set up, ready to talk to you, to offer sessions for you to watch videos um, from the comfort of your own home on an evening or a weekend. So hopefully there would be some time for you to, to start that engagement process. Um, virtually engage, virtually engage, virtual engagement, excuse me. Um, colleges have had to pivot. They've had to get innovative. So they are offering live campus tours, virtual campus tours, information sessions, student panels, one on one meetings with faculty. If you want some sort of virtual engagement activity with this with a college, it probably does exist. Um, so those are ways you can either passively, meaning that you're just kind of there and listening or actively really meeting one-on-one, -on -one, asking questions, um, connect with a college. So that is going to be, you know, what's your style of doing research? There's going to be a way to do that. There are schools that are open for campus visits. Um, PLU, we just opened two weeks ago, so we are doing campus visits, one family at a time, obviously lots of precautions, um, but it's kind of hit or miss which schools are and which ones aren't, but you can definitely check and see if they are. I think right now some of your best resources are the people that you surround yourself with or maybe even the people at your school or at colleges. Um, they, you have so many kind of uh, adults that have gone through this before, alumni of colleges and universities um, that you can really talk to. So uh, I know my husband's a teacher and he has to do office hours every day and says, they're not always attended. Um, so I imagine your schools are as well. and. Uh, is there a teacher that you have or is at your school who went to a school you're really interested in? Maybe you log into their office hours and ask them a couple questions about that experience or what they liked or didn't like about that school or any, you know, recommendations as you're thinking about applying um, that they might be able to help you out with. Uh, your guidance counselors are obviously great. There's community members you can also have conversations with about these things. Um, but then also there's a person like me on every college campus who works with students from Pierce County or Washington or even specifically the White River School District that you can reach out to um, to ask questions and connect with. I also recommend that there are some schools, especially if you're looking at some of the harder to get into colleges, some of the more competitive colleges, um, they might be looking at expressed interest. It's a new thing that colleges are tracking where um, not all of them, but the more competitive ones sometimes are. And that's where they're seeing like, how interested is a student in my college? And they're looking at things like responses to emails or um, click-through rates, which is so interesting to think about. So if you're getting emails, which I'm sure you are, <laughs> from all sorts of colleges, if you're not interested in the college, feel free to unsubscribe. We're totally fine with that. But also, if you are kind of interested or you're not sure, even just respond back with a thanks or maybe a question based on those things you've done some research on. Um, that will kind of give them the, the impression that you're interested, which is great. Uh, I put three websites on here. Again, I will make sure those are sent in the email, um, but those are all three websites that you can look at and compare colleges. Um, they pull information from national databases. There are reviews of colleges on there. They grade colleges for different things. Um, and niche.com is one of the ones that will tell you your likelihood of being accepted. So those are some websites you can play around with. You might like one's format better than another. So I wanted to put all of them on there. They all do about the same thing. So it's really about maybe which search kind of engine you like best. All right, so now that you maybe have done a little bit of research, again, quickly, <laughs> we're moving on, um, you're hopefully gonna apply to a couple colleges. Um, the average student applies to around five to seven colleges these days. Um, and we're going to use the acronym TREAT. It is October, so we're going to think about trick or treat as our way to kind of go through these um, five main requirements. But I do want to remind people that there are exceptions to every rule. 
I tried to put together what was most common across college campuses and I'm gonna mention when there's some differences but know that after this, I'm hoping that you'll have the confidence to also reach out to a college and say, hey, what's your stance on X? Or what do you do in this situation? So um, I'll give you some of those questions as we go too. All right, T is for transcript. So the first T is for transcript, uh, which is a, a major part of your application. For some schools, you're gonna to need to get an official copy of your transcript from your high school and your high school should have a way for you to request those. Um, for some, it's um, they're fine with an unofficial copy that the student can provide, um, email, attach, or even fax. Um, so schools will take them sometimes differently. And then some are gonna actually have you what's called self-report your courses. So they're not gonna want a transcript, but they're gonna want you to have had maybe a transcript sitting next to you and you'll kind of type in all the courses that you took. If any of you are applying to UW Seattle, for example, they have you self-report your grades and courses. They do not want a copy of your transcript. So that's where there's some difference there, but we all want at least something that shows us your courses and your grades. Uh, when we look at that, we're not just looking at the GPA and then moving on to the next element of your application. And I think a lot of students get really worried about that. Um, if you have a great GPA, you might be fine. But if you're someone who's like, oh, it's not exactly where I want it to be, that's okay. We're not just looking at that number. So we're going to look at what's called grade trend, which is maybe ninth grade wasn't your best, and but 10th grade was a little bit better. And then the start of 11th grade was maybe fine. Um, we're all going to take into account the spring semester in your 11th grade year um, was different. And we know that. Um, and so we are going to kind of look at that as an anomaly. If you were able to keep going and your grades were where they needed to be, great. But if spring was not your best semester because it was a lot of people, for a lot of people, really hard um, to transition to virtual learning, that's okay. And we will, I'm going to show you where you can even talk about that more if you want to. But we do know that. We also, on the application, there is usually a counselor report that comes with your transcript for most applications. Um, and what that does is it allows, or a high school report, um, it allows your high school to actually tell us what happened from their perspective during spring and what's going on right now. So you don't necessarily have to tell us that you went to virtual learning or that their grading system changed if it did or whatever the case may be. The school is going to be able to tell us that, um, but I'll talk to you about what you might be able to tell us um, about spring or this fall if you need to. Uh, we're going to look at challenging courses. So, you know, have you taken advantage of AP courses or um, honors courses or maybe running start? Um, we're going to look at those options and see kind of, you know, what you took advantage of and how you did in those courses. Um, but for some schools, rigor of coursework or challenging courses is, is really important. We're going to look at what you're choosing to take in your senior year. Um, we don't usually see grades from senior year, uh, but this is a year that many schools have said if you would like to have your mid-year report considered, which means first semester grades your senior year, um, they will. So they'll either re-review your application or look at it again for maybe even like scholarship purposes. Um, but a lot of schools are allowing students to turn in that first semester senior year transcript. Not all of them. So again, exceptions to every rule. If a school has a deadline and it's before your grades will be posted for fall, um, you're definitely going to want to ask them um, if they will, you know, look at those first semester grades if that's something you want. Again, not necessary, just giving you lots of options because of the people in the room, um, I don't know how, um, how spring went for you. So this is one of those things just to consider that we're not just looking at the number and moving on. There's a person that's really going to dig into your transcript, that's going to be asking questions, that's going to be really thinking about kind of your progress and the experiences that you've had along the way. So um, this is one of those where I just want you to know that we are, we are looking for ways to admit you when looking on the transcript. Um, and I don't always think that's what families think about um, when they think, oh gosh, I'm turning in this transcript. So just something to know. R is for recommendation. 
So this is a part of your application that you have no control over except for who you pick. Um, so pick wisely, right? Um, sometimes I actually think that picking a teacher who um, maybe you didn't, it wasn't your best grade, but it was one of those where you really improved or you showed a lot of resilience through the course, that can actually sometimes be your best recommendation. So really think about who's writing this. Uh, some schools ask for someone very particular. They want a specific type of teacher or specific type of person, but then some schools are like just a letter of recommendation. If it's pretty open, we do recommend a core academic teacher. So that's usually like um, English, social studies, science, math, you know, those types of courses, an AP class or something like that. Um, if a school accepts more than one recommendation, that's where then you would add maybe a community member or coach or an electives teacher as maybe a secondary application. Again, don't have to, just giving some tips um, depending on sometimes your likelihood of enrollment. Uh, so some schools have one, some schools have three, some schools have none. There are schools that do not require a letter of recommendation. If they don't require one, they usually don't want one, and sometimes it means they won't even read it. So really pay attention to what's required, um, and you can always ask if you really want to. Uh, give them time to write it. Again, those office hours that teachers are, are utilizing, that's a great time to pop in and ask if somebody might be willing um, to write you a letter of recommendation. And then I highly recommend you thank them. One of the things I'd like you to know as someone who reads a lot of these is they usually give us insight into you as a student differently than you would. And they're usually amazing to read. Um, and so I really wish that more like parents and family members and students got to hear how maybe their teachers talk about them. So. I've gotten some really great letters of recommendations from White River High School, so um, I know they do a really good job. E is for essay, uh, and I could do a whole session on the college admission essay. Um, it is definitely something that I know um, gives people a lot of stress sometimes. Uh, when I talk to students and I say, how's your college applications going? A lot of times I hear, I'm done, except for the essay. That's what I hear all the time. Um, and so I'm curious, before I go into the essay, where are you at? This is another thing I just love to know um, when it comes to the college essay. So a little poll to take a little break. Let me know. For those of you that are students, probably more than anybody, but maybe some of the parents and family members also know. All right, still moving pretty even across the board. All right, I'm gonna show you what the results are here in a second. All right, it's okay if you didn't get yours in, just curious, you'll see where some of your peers are. No, not yet, totally fine, it's still early in the fall. I'm really proud of those six of you though that are done, nice work. Um, and for those of you that have started, hopefully some of these little tips and tricks will help you um, feel confident finishing. So uh, for those of you that haven't started yet, I have a whole session on um, the college essay that I did in the spring and I saved it. So I'll make sure to put that in the email to all of you if you want. If you're having a really hard time getting started, um, that might be helpful. There's also a website on here at the bottom, collegeessayguy.com. He has some paid content, but he also has a lot of free content. Um, really great, like brainstorming activities, sample essays, um, ideas. Um, uh, he does podcasts and videos. So depending on your learning style, hopefully there's something on there that might help you get started. The essay is the one place you have full control from that first letter to that last punctuation mark. It's the one place on the application that we love as admission people who read these because it, it's your voice. It's where we get to know you the best. Um, uh, so it's really important. Um, I know there's a question in the q and I'll try to get to that in a second. Um, it's the, it's the best part of the essay for us to kind of uh, get a little bit of a sense of who you are. So for us, I always encourage you to think about this more like a story and less like an essay. So it doesn't need like a full introduction and a full conclusion and a five paragraphs and supporting statements. It doesn't need any of that. 
um, really those creative writing sections of your English classes are the best things to use. So think about setting and sense of place and feeling um, when writing these because there is a reader. And so think about those great books you've read and what keeps you reading. There needs to be some elements of that in this essay. Um, so really it's hard to put your whole life in a college essay. I don't recommend it. It's better kind of to pick one story or one theme um, and let that kind of represent or help introduce you to that college in some way. Help them get to know what your personality traits are. Some little tips, um, grammar, punctuation, spelling, flow do matter, not because we're checking for those, there's not an editor, um, but it can really distract from your story if, if that's um, not kind of up to par. Uh, and then also, don't repeat everything you already told us in the application. So there's an extracurricular section, there's a leadership section, um, and those are great parts where you don't wanna just relist those things. You can dive a little deeper into one of them, um, but don't necessarily just kind of list things back to back. Don't make it like kind of a fill in the blank essay. Um, uh, you can definitely email me um, essays and I can look at them, uh, or you can even just ask questions of me if you have an idea and wanna know how it would go. Um, but definitely think about it. The best way is read it out loud. If it sounds like your voice and at the end of it, you think we've gotten to know you a little bit better, you're probably in the right direction. Um, but I'll send you my full webinar on the essay um, for those of you that haven't gotten started yet. We do read these. That's the other thing I want you to know. Um, so I think some people think we don't. Uh, there are schools that don't require an essay. So just to go back to those exceptions, um, Washington State University, Central Washington University for a lot of their applicants um, don't require an essay. So this is one of those that's required for some and not for all. All right, A is for application, which obviously we're talking about the application, but the application has lots of pieces. And um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, how many, we've talked to the average students about five to seven, but um, we do recommend more than one, unless it's just PLU and then it's fine. No, I'm just joking. I do recommend more than one. Um, uh, you do have to think about cost in this. So again, this is that how much you're willing to pay. So it's free to apply to PLU, Whitworth's free. There's a few other free applications in the state, um, but there's also a lot that costs anywhere from 40 to $60. So this can get really expensive really quick if you haven't done some of that research we talked about um, in those first two slides. So that's why that research element, that thinking about college is really important um, so that you are applying to schools um, that really have, you know, an, an ability to support you. Uh, there are different types of applications. So some schools have their own application. You have to fill out their application. Um, there are some applications where you fill it out and it gets sent to quite a few schools. Um, you may have to pay separate application fees, but you don't have to do the application over and over again. So the common application and the coalition application are some of those. Um, the common application is, is pretty common. That's why it's called that. So um, we're on that, the Seattle Pacific University, Seattle University, University of Puget Sound, Whitworth. It's a lot of the private schools in Washington, even some of the public schools. I think Evergreen State College is on there. Um, the coalition application is something that UW Seattle is using. So if you are applying to UW Seattle, um, you will have to use the coalition application. That's what it's called. But there are other schools that belong to that as well. I don't know all of them, but um, not many in Washington. So if you're looking out of state, um, either of those applications might also work. If people have more than one application, maybe they have their own application and the Common App, they do not have a preference on which one you fill out. Just fill out the one that's best for you. Schools also have different types of deadlines. So if you haven't put some college deadlines on a calendar yet, I would highly recommend that you do um, because there are some schools where they have one application date, it's due that day, and if you're late by a minute, it's too late. So the only school like that that I can think of in this state is UW Seattle, but there are some across the United States. 
Um, otherwise, I would definitely say the rest of them have reasons you might apply earlier or later. Um, but usually if you apply early, um, you might have more chance of getting in to some of the more competitive schools. So they might be call it early action or early decision. Um, rolling admission means they just start accepting students and they roll admission through the fall and the spring um, and don't necessarily have a deadline where, where if you're too late, you're too late. Um, so we're a rolling admission campus. Our application is open. We um, just started accepting students this week uh, and we get back to people in three to four weeks. So there's no kind of wait for that. So that's an example of rolling admission. We all do holistic review, like every college in almost the whole world, it feels like. And what that means is it's not like it's just we're only looking for people with this GPA. If you don't have it, we're going to have you apply and then not let you in, right? So we are reviewing all these pieces of the application before making a decision. And if you think about it like a piece of pie, you might have parts of the application that are stronger and parts that are weaker. But if your pie still kind of equals a full pie, you probably still have a chance of being admitted even to some of those harder to get into colleges. Um, and so what you want to make sure is you're making those strong pieces, those bigger pieces of pie, as strong and solid as possible when you're putting together this application. Um, because we're looking at all of those things before making a decision and, uh, and it's um, uh, so sometimes it's hard for people to understand why some people get admitted or denied, but it's because of this holistic review process that we go through. Most applications get read by at least two people on a college campus. There's a lot of kind of factors that go into this. Um, but if we go back to that engage and connect piece, getting to know the person on a college campus that might be reviewing your application is always a great thing. So that's why if you do know the representative that's visiting your school or um, virtually these days, or um, I know that your counselors can um, help you figure out who those people are, uh, those are great people to reach out to, ask questions, connect with, um, because maybe they might advocate for you in that process as well. This year, for the first time ever, they've added what's called a community disruption section to the common application. There's a similar section on most other applications. Sometimes it doesn't have a specific title, it's just called the additional information section, but it's there for you to tell us something the application doesn't naturally ask. This is what the common applications community disruption section looks like this year. Um, and so it's really related to COVID-19 um, as well as um, natural disasters, uh, but it could be a lot of other things. You choose yes or no on whether you wanna answer this question. It is not a required question. Saying no to this does not like fault you in any way. But saying yes to this is where you could describe um, kind of your experience from the spring or this fall um, and how COVID-19 or any other natural disaster may have impacted your future plans, your ability to be involved, your grades, your finances. Um, you don't have a ton of words, only 250 words. Um, but it really does allow you to give, you know, or allow you a space to talk about that. So you don't have to talk about it in your college essay unless you really want to. So this is kind of that separate section for you to, for you to talk about some of those um, potential hurdles. Uh, I've also found that students are using it to tell us things they started doing during the pandemic. Um, so uh, uh, people are using it in a variety of ways. But again, not required, but there for you if you need it and please use it if you need it. We'd, we'd rather know. Um, so the last part of the application section is that there is an activities section, which we know again may have been impacted by um, the events of the spring and fall. Um, but we're really looking for kind of commitment and leadership defined broadly. Um, so we're not looking for the person with the longest list of activities. If you're that person, that's great. Um, but that's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're really looking for, you know, have you been committed to something or a couple things? Have you gotten better at them? Have you done more with them? Have you gained leadership through that commitment? Um, those are some of the things we're looking for when we look at these activities, these awards, this leadership activities. Um, the way to 
to fill out this section is to try to fill in some of those. So um, I like to use uh, swimming. We're going to use that as an example today. Um, I always pick different ones, but sometimes people put just put swimming for four years. But a lot of times I find that if you've been a swimmer, maybe you've taught swim lessons. That's its own line. Maybe you've been a lifeguard. That's its own line. Uh, maybe you've been on a club swim team. That could be its own line. You've been on the school swim team. That could be its own line. So swimming might actually be a lot to really show that commitment, um, might take up a few lines. Um, obviously, if you're someone with a lot of activities, maybe you do put that all in one line and then write all about it in that description section. Um, but that description section can also be where um, you tell us something about that leadership or um, hours or kind of what it took up in terms of your time. So they give you some space to, to describe it, not just list it. Uh, I will say that people are concerned, like, well, I did something at the start in, of 10th grade, but, um, or 11th grade, excuse me, but it was cut short because of COVID-19. Well, we're just asking for years. So if you did it in the fall of your 11th grade year, you still put that you did that in 11th grade. Um, and if you were planning to do that in 12th grade, you can still put 12 and then maybe talk about that in the description. So um, make that section work for you. Don't sell yourself short. Um, and this is a great section for sometimes family members to help you out with. I find that sometimes students forget some of the things they did over 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, um, but it's amazing how much family members remember. So use those people. And then last but not least, T is for test score. I think this is one of those things that's also causing a lot of questions this year. Last year, we were all telling you to take the tests, right? It didn't matter if we were test optional or not. We were encouraging you to do this as a part of your process. Sign up for them in the spring, sign up for an early one in the fall. Those were all the words that probably your school and anyone you talked to was um, encouraging you to do if you were college going. And now we've all told you, don't worry about it. Um, and that's a lot. That's a change in direction. It's a little confusing. Um, first, if a school requires an SAT or ACT still, they'll take either one. There's no preference. But over 1,600 colleges and universities, I think it's even more than that now, it changes every day, have gone to what's called test optional or test blind. Um, and fairtest.org is a website where if you're looking at a school and you don't know if they are, um, they're keeping track of this uh, and doing a really great job, actually, and describing the differences and what's required. Test optional means you get to choose. So you say, yes, review my test score, or no, don't review my test score, and then that school does that. Test blind means that a school is not going to look at test scores at all. doesn't matter if you submit them or don't submit them. So schools are, are choosing one or the other policy. Um, but you can definitely ask. We have some students who are saying, well, I want to apply now, but what if I get a good test? I'm, or, I'm planning to take the test, and what if I get a good score? Um, you can definitely ask a school if they're willing to review those at a later date, because um, some schools are also allowing that option. But if I were you, I wouldn't stress out about this. There's so many schools that have gone test optional that if you've signed up and they've been canceled or you don't know if you should sign up, uh, do some of that research, check to see if any of your schools are still test optional, are, are still requiring a test score. And if so, maybe you have to. But I think what you're going to find for the most part is, is we don't need them and don't care if you turn them in. It doesn't. Um, it's not going to impact your ability to get accepted or your ability to get scholarships at any school I've talked to. Um, Washington State, I think I've talked to every college um, director of admission except for maybe two in the whole state. Uh, and all of us have permanently gone test optional or test blind. So this impacts sophomores and freshmen too. Um, we're not going to go back. And all of us are not using them for admission or scholarship purposes if a student elects not to send them in. So. I hope that just reassures some of you that are nervous about this. And just kind of what I started with, there are exceptions to every rule. So I can't cover every college and every college's decisions. I'm going to get to your questions here in a second, um, but there's just a couple other slides with some last final tips. You can get in. I promise there's a college for every student because um, there's so many different types and shapes and styles of colleges out there. Um, most schools are not highly selective. I even put the acceptance rates from niche.com of four state schools and four private or independent colleges and you will see that the majority of us in Washington accept over 70% of our applications. So. Um, 
that's a lot. That's more, more, way more students getting in than not getting in. Uh, use the additional information section or that community disruption section if you need to. We'd rather know than have lingering questions as we review your application. Take your time. You're in charge. You're deciding where to apply and you'll ultimately decide where to go. And I encourage you to separate those two questions. Right now, you're just thinking about where am I going to apply? Where do I want to research a little bit further? Where am I curious about? Um, Later, you have to think about where you're going to attend or where you're going to go. Some people try to answer both those questions at the same time, and I think it gets a little bit too much. Um, just a reminder, there's a person reading your application. So I'm the person who reads applications from White River High School for PLU. I get them first, um, but there's a person like me uh, on lots of college campuses, most college campuses. And just to remind you that it is good to connect. These are three upcoming national or uh, virtual college fairs, well, two virtual college fairs in a session. Um, there's a webinar this Friday, um, and I'll make sure you get this as well um, in that email, where if you are like really nervous about joining a virtual college fair, uh, there's going to be a couple of my colleagues that actually walk you through that. Um, and the other two are college fairs where you can engage and connect with colleges um, in a virtual environment, uh, not just Washington State colleges, but colleges all over the nation at both of those. The National College Fair is going to be a little bit bigger. For some students, it's a little more overwhelming. There's about, I think, 500 colleges at that one. Um, the Regional College Fair is a little bit more regionally based, so more schools from the Western United States, a lot more schools from Washington, including community colleges. And then this is PLU's examples. I'm just using an example to really highlight how much colleges are doing. We're a small school, and this is all the different ways you can virtually connect with us. Um, so whether you want to passively or actively engage with a college, they're offering those opportunities. This is my direct contact information. So um, my name, my email, you can call or text me. We all started professional Instagram accounts this year, so you can also just send me a direct message through there. Um, I even have a way to want, schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with me as well. It connects directly to my Zoom account and my calendar. Um, the QR code is if you want more information about PLU. When you registered, you may have checked yes, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if the student didn't register or you want to give us more information, that's what you can scan that and fill out. It's a quick little form. Um, but I am going to take this opportunity to look at the questions. So if you have a question, put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and I will just go through them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one by one. The nice thing about questions is generally if you have a question, I bet you someone else in this space has it too. So put it in there. You can even put them in anonymously. So um, a student or someone asks, if you are a running start student, should you provide both high school and college transcripts? At the time of application, you just supply your high school transcript. Your high school has done an excellent job um, putting those classes on your transcript and putting R's in the little column. Um, so that's all we need for the application. If you decide to attend that college, you will need to send an official community college or college transcript as well, because that's what allows us to actually transfer the credits but we don't transfer credits until a student decides to attend our college. So um, you don't need to turn in that community college or college transcript until you decide where you're going. So the high school transcript should be plenty. And if there are other Running Start students in here, I just wanna make sure you know, you do apply to college as a first year student, or so you're using the first year or the freshman application, not the transfer application. Um, because even though you have transfer credits, you're still also graduating from high school. And it's to your benefit, there's a lot more scholarships for freshmen. So um, it's actually a good thing. Is it required to have a core subject teacher as a recommender on your applications? Could all my recommenders be elective teachers or extracurricular instructor instructors? Ultimately, it depends on what the school wants. Um, and if the school doesn't give you direction, then you can technically turn in whatever you want. Um, but I would say that I would look at your likelihood of enrollment. If you're super likely to get in, 
fine. But if you're someone who it's a little bit of a stretch school, I would say at least one academic teacher would be really important for a school to know how you did in those kind of core courses because colleges also have general education or core classes that you have to take. Um, and so they want to know that you can be successful in both your elective courses, but also in those core courses as well. So I think it's going to depend on school, but that would be my tip um, to maybe have at least one uh, core teacher in your in your smattering of recommendations. Great questions. All right. Um, when applying to a college, if it says that the college is test optional, but the website requires a score input, what can you put in as a placeholder? Um, so maybe the application requires one or the thing, just put in zeros or put in NA if it's not available, if it lets you put in letters, um, but otherwise put in zeros, it probably means that the application at some point will ask you if you'd like to be test optional or not. So yeah, um, a lot of those allow you to skip them without any score being put in. Um, so that's another option just to see if the application will let you keep going without a score inputted. Yeah, great question. All right. Um, so this is somebody, another test score one. Um, so they've had their SAT canceled three times and I'm worried that especially at a more selective college that is test optional that can make or break my application. Um, so I've been talking to lots of schools. Um, I even called University of Washington in Seattle for this, which is the only competitive college in the state. <laughs> um, and uh, they, every school I've talked to, whether they're competitive or not competitive, says take their word for it. If they say test optional, it's okay to apply test optional, that it's not going to hurt your chances. Because we know these tests being canceled and your ability to take this test is not your fault at all. It has no impact on your application. So, um, uh, so when we evaluate a, an application without a test score, it means that pie we were talking about, you're taking out the test, we're now taking out the test score piece of the pie. And yes, we're now only really reviewing those other four parts or if this, the school has additional application materials, those parts of the application. So yes, those are gonna carry a little bit more weight um, than maybe they would have with the test score in there. Um, but as someone who's reviewed applications for 20 years, rarely does the test score make or break our admission decision. Um, because for the most part, the test score kind of matches the grades. Um, so it's not like the test score is gonna be the thing that pulls you in um, because we're, we're more concerned with how you did over four years of college or four years of high school than how you did on one random Saturday where we don't even know what the situation was, right? Like maybe you had homecoming the night before when we used to have that, or maybe you were sick, but that was the only test you had. Um, so the test score was always a little bit uh, of a quandary for us as colleges to know how um, to use that. So I actually think this the, the test optional application is a little bit more transparent of what is actually important in the application. So you can definitely talk to a school though. Again, don't feel like you can't reach out to a college and say exactly what you just said in that question, which is, I'm concerned that if I don't have this, it's gonna hurt my chances. Can you tell me a little bit about how my application will be reviewed? That's a perfectly fine answer. Um, uh, what about AP scores? Will those help um, carry weight um, if I don't have an SAT? So we don't usually see your, ACE, your AP scores when you apply to college. We see that you've taken AP classes, but we rarely actually see the scores. Some applications ask for it, so you'll be able to put it there. But yes, when I talked about rigor of coursework, AP scores and AP classes are things that we will consider as a part of that, um, that rigor. So that's always been something we've really looked at. Um, at PLU, for example, we actually weight GPAs. So we bump GPAs up for every AP, pre-AP, or honors class that a student has taken um, because we really want to see what those classes um, so we put you on a 4.5 scale versus a 4.0 scale. Uh, it allows us to compare students, we think, in a more authentic way um, so that 
uh, we see that. Not every school does. So that's also a question you can ask a college is, um, do they weight your GPA as a part of the application process or not? Um, and if they don't, then they're probably really going to look at like those scores and those, um, those AP classes uh, as something that shows them that you took challenging courses. So yes, that will really help um, an application to a more competitive college. Is it true that getting an AA degree, it will transfer to any in-state college? Um, I will say it will transfer to any in-state public college and the majority of in-state private colleges. Um, I have not asked this question of every college um, in the state, so I don't want to say yes for sure, but I know the public schools have to take your associate's degree. Um, PLU is very transfer friendly, so we take the full thing um, and transfer it over as like a group of courses, much like the state schools do, um, but I can't answer that for every private school. So I would encourage you if you're looking at other private schools to ask them if they don't have it on their website, kind of what some of their running start policies are? Great question. All right. Are there any other questions out there? Um, it looks like the majority of you are still here, which is great. I haven't lost you for the evening. You're not, um, you're either eating or uh, about to eat, I would imagine. Um, but if you have any last minute questions, feel free to throw them in. Um, but I also want to remind you that that contact information is there for you to use, whether you are applying to PLU or not. So if you have questions just related to college and are having a hard time getting them answered or because it's a new question, no one really knows, um, feel free to ask me. It doesn't mean I'll have all the answers, but at least I can maybe give you some direction in which to get started so you can answer those. Um, so feel free to contact me um, and I will try to send you this recording as well as um, the presentation and some links uh, hopefully by tomorrow. So so you have those in your inbox um, and that will allow you to also just respond to that email if that's easiest for you. All right, last, last moment. All right, thank you, yeah, for coming. I know everyone's busy um, uh, and hopefully it was at least a little bit helpful. It's a lot of information to cover um, in an hour, so um, hopefully I got through enough. Uh, if you've moved high schools, you need a transcript from both high schools. Um, it'll depend. So what you want to do is look at your White River High School transcript and see if they put those, those credits on there. If they did, you should just require a, a White River transcript. But if they didn't, which some schools don't, you would require both. So check with White River first and then um, go from there. Great question. Usually if you transferred in Washington, it's easier. If you went out of state, it kind of depends on, um, on the school. All right, good job. All right, well, have a great evening. Thank you for joining me. Um, and hopefully I'll hear from some of you soon.